Can government leaders withstand the heat in Iraq? It's another summer of discontent as violent protests in the south spread north all the way to the capital, Baghdad. What's fueling the anger? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hashem Bahal Barra. Security has been tightened in Baghdad and southern Iraq because more anti-government protests are expected. Several Iraqis have already been killed protesting against frequent electricity cuts, clean water shortages and lack of job opportunities. Security forces firing tear gas and water cannon have struggled to quell the anger. The latest protests first began in the southern city of Basra, where roads leading to the seaports and oil fields were blocked and the offices of political parties torched. The arrest soon spread north to Nasiriya and Najaf, then Diyala province and the capital Baghdad, despite the deployment of extra security personnel. Imran Khan has more from the capital, Baghdad. A number of key religious political and military leaders have thrown their support behind the protest movement. Hadi Al-Amri, who's one of the leaders of the Shia militias, the Popular Mobilization Forces, has said the protesters' demands must be respected. Muqtada al-Sada, whose political bloc won big in the May 12th elections, has also weighed in, saying that no government should be formed until the protesters' demands are met. Now, it's easy for those uh, leaders to be able to throw their support behind the protest movement because they draw a lot of support from the south where the protest movement is based uh, so they're playing effectively to the gallery there however the government is listening it's understanding that it does need to address uh, these demands from the protesters uh, in the last few days they've sent a high level energy delegation to saudi arabia to negotiate uh, with saudi arabia to try and get electricity into the south this whole crisis was sparked when uh, Iran stopped supplying electricity to the South because it was owed a billion and a half dollars in unpaid bills. Now, in unpaid bills, sorry. Now, Saudi Arabia is a regional rival and has long been concerned about Iran's role in Iraq. So they likely to use this to try and gain some political leverage here in Iraq. The protesters have issued 14 demands to the government and they're giving the government some time to be able to address uh, those 14 demands and come up with some short-term solutions. So although we may well see a way out of this crisis, it will be short-term unless there is some very long-term thinking that goes on and addresses the root causes of what the protesters' demands are. Remember, it's effectively just two things, energy supply into the south and economic reforms and an end to corruption and jobs for local people. Imran Khan, Al Jazeera for Inside Story in Baghdad. Iraq has major economic problems. Despite having the world's fifth largest oil reserves, foreign companies dominate the oil industry. The government promised to restore economic stability after last year's defeat of ISIL. But many blame the government for corruption and not doing enough to prevent the disappearance of billions of dollars. Much of Iraq's electricity supply, especially in southern parts, comes from Iran. But after suffering power shortages of their own, Iran reduced Iraq's supply, causing frequent power blackouts and outage in Iraqi homes. Let's bring in our panel. In Baghdad, Ahmed Roshdi, senior foreign policy advisor for the Speaker of the Iraqi Parliament. In Cambridge, Renad Mansour, a fellow in the Middle East and North Africa program at the British-based think tank Chatham House. And in Tehran, Hamid Mosawi, a professor of political science at Tehran University. Welcome to you all. Ahmed, uh, summer discontent over electricity shortages. This is not something new in Iraq. I mean, but what's particular about this time? Well, this time is different. Uh, previously, Sham, uh, there were so many demonstrations in previous years talking about, uh, uh, or less mainly about services, electricity, water, unemployment, and so on. And at the same time, there were some sort of solutions that uh, the government actually made previously, which is not actually, uh, it looks like actually it's not, it, it's not uh, capable of solving the whole problem. Now, we have a new thing in this demonstration is that 
not only people blaming the government, but also people blaming the political parties that are responsible to make the government, who are participating in elections, has MPs inside the parliament. Now, this, let's say, this new thing mm -hmm. pushes to, uh, to understand how much uh, the people actually uh, get get fed from from all those processes from all the political processes that uh, starting from the, the, let's say for for about 14 years mm -hmm. the problem is that we don't have until now a real reform inside the pot political process that it will manage Iraq crisis. Mm -hmm. Yes, we fought Daesh, we defeated Daesh, we made a victory against Daesh. That's because all Iraqi people, Sunni Shia and Kurds, uh, convinced, convinced that the, our first enemy is Daesh. But now the problem is that uh, with the boycott that happened in the elections, mm -hmm. which means that people actually get fed from the political process, okay. they will not engage with any elections uh, anymore. And at the same time, they are looking for good services to, to push them toward the real political process that is supposed to be happening. Before we uh, get into the domestic politics, uh, Renan, we're talking about people grappling with how to get electricity on a daily basis in what is supposed to be one of the richest nations on earth. They generate something like $260 million every day from oil. What's the problem here? This is the sort of the sad irony of it, and particularly in a city and province like Basra, where, you know, Iraqis from Basrawis from the, the area know that they're sitting on most of the wealth, and they can see the international companies coming. They can see how much their leaders, their own leaders, it doesn't mean if they're Shia, Sunni, or Kurd, or other, all of the leaders have become very wealthy and very powerful in this trade. That has never trickled down to the people. So then the fault line is becoming the gap between the sort of the elite and the citizens. And the citizens are asking, why is it that we sit on so much wealth and we don't have basic services? Uh, and this is a call that's been happening for some time now. I mean, since the summer of 2015, this movement has continued and it's growing stronger and stronger. And it's not interested in leader like changes or, you know, symbolic changes in leaderships. What it's interested in is systemic reform. They want to change the system that was built 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hamid, Iran has been uh, providing electricity for areas like Basra in particular, but this time they decided uh, to cut off the uh, electricity. Is it because the Iraqis are not paying the bills? Is it because Iran is facing its own problems or is it politically motivated? Um, right now, Iran is actually experiencing a very extreme energy shortage, electricity shortage. So the reason Iran has cut off that uh, power supply has been because of its own domestic problems. We have to remember that from Iran's perspective, instability in Iraq is actually very bad for Iran. Uh, first of all, it can spread to Iran's southern provinces. And also the political parties that have been running Iraq in the past few years have been very close to Iran. So instability is definitely bad for Iran. Nevertheless, I think uh, if the summer is over, then Iran will be able to again provide electricity to Iraq's southern provinces. Ahmed, we're talking about Basra, the uh, focal point of the protest movement, where, which accounts for about 80% of Iraq's oil exports. But people are saying we are poor, we are discriminated against. Who should get this message into account? Is it the political establishment? Who in particular? Well, it, it, it has three levels, Hisham. It has the domestic level, or let's say the local level, mm -hmm. which Basra actually is suffering from is that there is a, a huge conflict between the, the political parties there in Basra. And uh, also, let us not forget corruption. Uh, uh, Basra, one of the uh, suffer from highest, the highest corruption in Iraq. So you can imagine how much people actually seeing not only uh, the, the oil battle, but, but also the seaport that, that's already had so many, uh, uh, so many work for the political parties and there is no real jobs. Uh, to, the, to, the, to the Basra people. Uh, the second level is actually the political level, or let's say the central le political level, which means that uh, even the central government, which is made by the political parties, didn't manage not only to fight corruption, but also didn't manage to have the real services to be uh, implanted to the, to the civilians. Mm. At the same time, where the government saying that we made so many projects, we made so many infrastructure projects, we, we paid huge 
amount of money about it. The third level is actually the regional level, which means that we are talking about Iran, we are talking about Saudi Arabia, okay. and also we, t we are talking about uh, the United States and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, Renard, I mean, it's very simple. If a country faces power shortage or a power crisis, basically it has two, two options. Let's take Iraq as a case. They have oil, they can use that to generate uh, electricity, or they can harness the power of the sun. They have two options, it's easy, and they have cash. They can tap into those resources and solve the problem. Why is this becoming something of a, an endemic case in Iraq? To put it frankly, the system is broken. I mean, if you think of how much money, how much investment has gone inside of Iraq and then Iraq has made off of oil and energy since 2003, we're talking hundreds of billions, you know, we're talking about a lot of money. And yet that doesn't trickle down to the people. Um, and this is, as I say, the, the irony of it all and the people see this. Just because you have the resource doesn't mean that that resource can be used efficiently. It's a systemic problem. The government the way the state has been built in 2003 has been unable to respond to the basic needs of the citizens. Simply changing individuals here and there isn't going to change this structural problem. It's an endemic problem that's mm -hmm. becoming entrenched, which is even, you know, a, a concern for the citizens. Hamid, there was a quite an interesting moment during the protests in Basra where Iraqis started to chant anti-Iran slogans, burning some of the photos of the top leadership of Iran. How was that message perceived by the Iranian authority? Well, I mean, it's very clear that within Iraq there are differences and divisions. I mean, some groups strongly support Iran, others see perhaps Iran as a source of the problem. Uh, nevertheless, I would say that perhaps it is the inefficiency of the own Iraqi government rather than outside influence that is to blame for these issues. By the way, Hamid... Um, of course, I'm not denying sorry, that Iran has... Their, sorry to interrupt yes. you there. We're not talking about any other place but Basra, which is predominantly Shia, which considers itself to be some sort of religiously connected with Iran. So that could be something quite interesting. Yes, and I mean, and I mean, we experienced that during the elections as well. So just because some areas of Iraq are Shia doesn't necessarily mean that they are pro-Iranian. In fact, uh, Muqtada al-Sadr, which has actually gained a lot of seats in the current elections, um, he has been quite critical of Iran. Um, so nevertheless, this is why I'm saying these kinds of instabilities are bad for Iran. Um, at the same time, I think at the end of the day, the only government that can solve these issues is the Iraqi government. Iran can help, of course, but it's them that have to solve it. Um, also, we have to remember that um, Iraq had been battling and struggling with ISIS for a very long time, and they were only officially defeated in December. So it's only been eight months, and I think we have to give more time mm -hmm. to the Iraqi government to hopefully fix things. Iraq is currently run by a caretaker government as votes are being recounted following disputed election results. So who are the power brokers? Shia cleric Muqtada Sada confirmed his influence when his Zairun bloc won May's election but failed to win a majority. But he didn't put himself forward as prime minister. He's well known for his nationalism and a long-time opponent, opponent of both Iranian and US influence. Current Prime Minister is Haider al-Abadi. He declared victory over ISIL last year, but he's not been able to deliver on his promises of peace and stability, and his influence is thought to be dwindling. Hadi al-Amiri and the al-Fatih party came second in the election two months ago. He's known to have close ties with Iran, where he lived in exile for 20 years and headed a coalition of armed groups against ISIL. Amiri has tried to translate this success on the battlefield into political influence. Finally, Nouri al-Maliki served as Iraq's prime minister for 10 years from 2006. He is known for his strong ties with the US and Iran, as well as his continued influence in the balance of power. He's been accused of corruption, as well as failure to prevent the rise of ISIL, which ultimately led to his ousting as prime minister. Ahmed, many people seem to be saying that Perhaps it's Muqtada Sadr who is triggering the unrest now in Iraq to advance his own political agenda. What do you think about this? 
Well, uh, at the end, the, the demonstration, uh, um, uh, honestly speaking, the, in, the, in the beginning, it was, no, no, it was spontaneous. People get outside uh, their houses because there is no electricity, there is no water. So at, uh, in the beginning, it was normal that people actually suffering from all those errors that made by the Iraqi government in way or another. The most important thing is that what's happened after that is that how, how and who can get benefit from all those uh, demonstrations. And there were attacks. Then there were attacks on political uh, parties' uh, headquarters in, ma in many governorates. And it looks like that actually people not, not only blaming uh, Haider al-Abadi, they're also blaming al-Fatih uh, and, and, and state of law at the same time which means that they are already blaming the one who won and, and also the one who has already previously have some sort of a power, authority, inside the Iraqi government in one or another. And also the Assad uh, also have been attacked. So it, it shows you that uh, at the end, uh, uh, the, the pressure is on, the, uh, on this caretaking government, on Haider al-Abadi, on the previous parliament, which is, has majority mm -hmm. from, let's say, 70 uh, uh, MPs, belongs to state of law, uh, to Maliki, and also the presence now of Fatih and Badr and so on. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine how much this pressure actually made a progress in a way or another to talk about how can I speak to my opponents in a way to solve the problem. Okay. Which I think nowadays they are talking about, Sayyid Muqtada said, said okay, okay, guys, let's stop. Let's stop talking about the government. Please give the services for the people. Then we're going to talk about the government. Okay. And it's a clever movement because at the end we need about, let's say, two months until we're going to see two months or maybe three months until we can see uh, a new government, a new parliament. Renan, many had high hopes that after the, 2000, the May 2018 elections, we might see an end to identity politics in Iraq. Now with this protest movement, do you have any concerns that the identity politics, sectarianism, could come back in full swing more than any time before? Well, first of all, I think it's important to sort of raise a question. Iraqis want change, and they're asking, how can we change the system? Um, and what they're realizing is that identity politics isn't the way to change the system. They're also realizing that elections aren't the way to change the system. Because, again, quite frankly, even though there was an election, even though every politician promised change, eventually in the government formation process that's ongoing today, it looks like the same leaders are going to come together, they're going to compromise, and they're going to split the national pie, as they say. So what Iraqis are seeing, really, is there's no real way to institutionally bring about change. Now, to answer the question about identity politics, I think it's important to kind of have a nuance here, which is what you're seeing on the ground is in Basra, the Shia are protesting against their own Shia leaders. Mm -hmm. In Kurdistan, in Sleimania, for example, the Kurds are protesting against their own Kurdish leaders. So because areas like Baghdad, like Basra, like Sleimania haven't seen, like, acute violence for several years now, because the sort of stability in terms of just security is improving, they're beginning to ask more for from their leaders, and their leaders can no longer just gain legitimacy mm -hmm. by using ethno-sectarian discourse. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to start promising things that people are expecting more. So that's what we mean by sort of this kind of move away from identity politics. But unfortunately, the way the system is structured mm -hmm. under the guise of inclusivity means that you have to have identities. So it's actually the system and elections that are reinforcing identities when the people are trying to move past that. I see your point. Hamid. Is there any concern among the political establishment in Iran that if the movement crosses the Rubicon, it could lead to a new political system in Iraq? And Iraq has had strong uh, relationship with Iran over the last few years. I mean, definitely Iraq is a major strategic concern for Iran. And I would say the most important issue for Iran is the influence of Saudi Arabia and the United States within Iraq. And issues and protests such as what we are witnessing right now actually creates a window of opportunity for countries such as Saudi Arabia to expand their influence in Iraq. And that is, in fact, very worrying for Iran. Um, and I think that is why Iran has been um, very helpful towards the Iraqi government in overcoming these challenges. I mean, uh, we all remember that Iran was um, the first country to help Iraq in defeating ISIL. Nevertheless, what we are witnessing right now is very difficult for Iran 
to help the Iraqi government, just because, as I mentioned, Iran is experiencing its own very severe power shortages. So definitely, Iraq is a major strategic concern mm -hmm. for Iran. Ahmed, we've seen Muqtada Sadr saying that we need to stay away from forming a government, give it, give it more time to solve this political problem. Do the political elite, Ammar al-Hakim, Muqtada Sadr al-Amari, uh, uh, al-Maliki, feel that this could be the beginning of the end and the beginning of a new chapter in Iraq? Well, it's a new chapter if there will be a real change inside the political process. It's not only speaking in front of the people. It's not only talking. We need some sort of a work. We need some sort of a, change, a real change inside the whole system, inside the political system, and most importantly, inside our economical system. And we all know that our uh, economical laws is depending on socialism uh, before 2003. Until now, it didn't change until now. So we cannot make any progress without changing those laws, making a new laws to have some sort of opening market, to have some sort of, of a deal with the West or with the international community that Iraq is some sort of strategic alliance, a strategic economical alliance, and so on. So it's not only talking. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the, the problem is that Iraqis will not forgive anyone if the situation will still on this uh, on this level of no electricity, no water, unemployment, and so on. Uh, and all those problems actually was, was actually covered by the presence of Daesh. Now, there is no Daesh. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be defeated. They are all, they, they are all become some sort of a gangs in caves and, and mountains and so on. So we need to see actually what's going to happen okay. after that. Because we all know also that the destroyed cities until now didn't rebuild. So, and we all know also there are sleeping cells of Daesh. They're going to say to the people, OK, OK, guys, you substitute us uh, with whom? With, with the okay. destruction that happened to your houses and homes and governorates? That's a, the, 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 that's a point I would like also to uh, talk about with uh, Rinad. Uh, Mr. Mansour, the World Bank has been saying basically that the macroeconomic outlook of Iraq should be good in the coming years, particularly with the defeat of ISIL. Oil now is, uh, has been in the increase for quite some time. Would Iraq be able to rebuild the country, answer the demands of the people, with the same mentality which has been prevailing for some time. Poor governance, embezzlement of public funds, and incredible corruption that we've been seeing across all the levels of the political elite. Yes, that's a good question. I mean, I wouldn't call this socialism. I'd call this kleptocracy. Um, very clearly, the system of the culture of kickbacks and the corruption and the system that's been unable uh, to, to trickle down to the citizens continues to exist. And you can continue to put money into the system. You can continue to sell oil. You can have oil at 100. You can have oil at 150. That doesn't mean that more money will go to the, to the citizens, because the system, as you say, is the problem. Problem. And many people say oil itself is a curse. Um, and actually having so much money empowers the elite rather than convincing the, convincing the elite to change the system for it to trickle down. So I know the World Bank, I know the IMF and many of the international organizations mm -hmm. are very concerned um, with the sort of system in, in Iraq and the economic system in mm -hmm. Iraq and in many of the provinces at the local and central government level. So it's, it's really hard to say. Okay. And as I say, the word reconstruction has been used in Iraq since 2003. Hamid, very briefly, please. Uh, should Iran be also very concerned if its top allies in Iraq are facing huge problems? They're seen as very unpopular among their own people. Yes, I mean, I think it's very concerning for Iran, but I think it should also be a concern for other players as well. From Iran's perspective, um, the fall of these bureaucrats, as corrupt as they may be, mm -hmm. uh, would lead to the rise of extremist groups such as ISIL. And I think that can have major consequences both for Iran and Thank the you. region if it happens, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ahmed Rushdi, Rinad Mansour, Hamid Mousawi. Uh, I really appreciate your conversation. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website aljazeera.com for further discussion. Go to our Facebook page, that's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Hashem Ahlbara, the whole team here. Bye for now.